a show where we interview leaders in the building industry to unpack the tools, tactics, and strategies they use to run amazing organizations. Uh, today, I'm very, very excited to be joined by Jackie Park. Uh, Jackie Park works on customer engagement and sales enablement at Airtable, a low-code platform to build collaborative apps. Um, we'll kind of talk a little bit about her background, but needless to say, she's uh, a former architect that transitioned into uh, the tech industry. And so we're, we're very excited to kind of unpack some of her lessons along the way. Thanks so much for joining me, Jackie. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Cool. So um, I, I think we just kind of start at the, at the beginning and maybe you can walk us a little bit through your career trajectory thus far. Um, what got you into architecture uh, until now? Yeah, that's a great and, and loaded question. So <laughs> I guess if I go back to what got me into architecture in the first place, it was really an intro to environmental design course that I took my second semester at Berkeley. And before then, I didn't really have exposure to design, let alone architecture. And so it was a really big eye-opening experience for myself. And I realized that, you know, oh, I really love this. I kept going with it, transitioned or transferred from the department that I was in into CED and just kept going with it from there. And so, you know, I realized that if I wanted to stay with architecture, then I eventually wanted to go back to grad school to be able to dig in even more. Um, but in between, I had the opportunity to to work at um, a couple of firms. And the bulk of my experience before grad school came from a firm called Ehrlich Architects in LA. Um, I think right now it's called EYRC. But um, similar to um, another firm that I worked at more recently, it's a really great mid-sized firm that does really good work across a portfolio of residential, institutional, commercial projects. Um, and I was there for three years um, before going to grad school. I'll try not to be, have this be like a whole linear path, but um, I think, you know, from working at various firms um, before starting to pivot, you know, I really believed in the work that was being done. And I also experienced a lot of the pain points in that, you know, architects spend all of our time, you know, designing, creating for others. And though, and a lot of the time, you know, we just didn't have the tools that we needed to, to work smarter rather than harder. Or if we did, they weren't designed with architects in mind. Um, and even when they were, I think a lot of times architects are pushing the limits of, of what, you know, the tools can do. So, you know, back in the, the day, or like architects, they were really early adopters of BIN, of Revit. I think back in 2007, they were using Revit even for their residential projects. And um, for the larger projects that I was working on, I hope this has changed at this point, but you know, you had to coordinate to, to save to central because that meant like for 30 minutes, like the rest of the team couldn't work. And so I think that's just one example of how, um, you know, oftentimes the tools or sort of like the level of performance of the tools hasn't really been there for, for architects to do their work. That's, uh, and so from from your, your time between that firm and then grad school, did you also end up focusing also on architecture in grad school? Like what, what was there, what was that kind of like second half? Yeah, um, I continued studying architecture and focusing on that at the GSD. Uh, while I was there, I had the opportunity to intern with Architecture Research Office in New York, ARO, and that's mm -hmm. where I continued after graduating. And I think it was during that time there that, you know, I continued to, I worked on a lot of great projects, but then also continued to feel a lot of those pain points more acutely. And so I think where a lot of maybe the seeds were planted for where I ended up today was this really intense design build project that I worked on that, you know, from the time the project started to when it was done with construction, it was 12 months. Hmm. And so if you can imagine just even the process of trying to put together an ff &E package in a super compressed timeline with all of the criteria you need to hit up front. So not just like design, but also like cost, lead time, performance. Um, the client had really strict um, criteria that it needs to hit. Um, there just wasn't a better way to do it than like brute force. And it was a lot of overtime hours to make sure that 
we landed on a, an option that you know checked all those boxes and that the client was happy with. But I think we'll see in a bit later today, just um, the example that I walked through in our table is what I existed or wish existed back then. Um, but, you know, coming out of that time at, at ARO, I think I realized that I really gravitated towards, you know, helping my teammates and helping the, the firm in a way operate better because mm. I think I'm just drawn to, and I think actually a lot of architects have this tendency, like if we see a problem, like we want to fix it and we don't want to just like do like a surface right. fix, like we want to go to the root of the problem. And so I'm like, why does this suck so much? Like <laughs> this should, there should be something better. And, you know, it, at the time, you know, there wasn't really anything to help organize you know, sort of a central repository of information that isn't just a physical binder library, you know, and I know right. that there are tools like Folio today that help to address this pain point. Um, but at that time, it was really just disparate spreadsheets, um, physical PDFs and binders, or just literally clicking into every single site and sort of trying to gather that into a single doc or a sheet somewhere. Um, and so that's really sort of what set me on my path in trying to find ways to, to help architects at least do that part of the, the work better. And so at Airtable, can you can you maybe give the kind of, uh, I sort of described it, but I'm sure you could do maybe a packet a little bit further, but what, what exactly is Airtable and how does, how does it work? Got it. And this is, this is the elevator pitch question, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, to be quite honest, this is something that we even struggle with today because Airtable is such a horizontal product. And it sort of reminds me of like, you know, when you try to design for everybody, you design for nobody and it nothing resonates mm -hmm. and nothing lands and it just becomes platitudes. So, you know, for architects, I usually describe Airtable as a digital kit of parts that allows you to create the applications that you need. And an application could be, you know, a product and material library. It could be a way to track all the projects that are coming into your practice. And so, Airtable is really just that flexible toolkit that allows yeah. you to, to create the things that you need to get your work done. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've come across Airtable in my, a lot of different instances. Um, at, at WeWork, I know that Airtable was pretty much the back, a big part of the backend infrastructure. WeWork for almost, was an early adopter. <laughs> yeah, for, for almost all projects. I mean, I, I think it was a, it's all projects were being sort of tracked in, in there from a uh, from from a very data from a data driven perspective, which is really fascinating, um, and a lot of people used it to, which I think you'll kind of show us in, in a second here. It's kind of like how they were able to use it for um, FFNE, which is a very interesting use case that's, that's so common across so many firms. Um, but but before we kind of dive in a little bit into that, like, what is your current role? I kind of described it as customer engagement, sales enablement. Maybe you can unpack that a bit for for you know our audience here who might not be familiar with those terms. Yeah, absolutely. And I realize it's a lot of words strung together. So maybe to unpack that, I sit on the customer engagement team and at Airtable that includes everyone who interfaces with our enterprise customers. So it's the sales team, it's customer success, and it's the support team as well, though they, they span both enterprise and, and um, self-serve customers. Uh, Sales enablement is really the, the process of empowering everyone on the sales team with the skills, the content, and the training they need to, to sell more effectively. Hmm. Um, and so what does that, I guess it materializes in different types of documents, different types of presentations? Uh, it could be, you know, a series of trainings. It could be a series of, you know, maybe decks to help support a point that they're trying to land um, in a certain scenario. Um, I think that is one of the things that, you know, I know my, my background is non-traditional in comparison to what a lot of sales enablement folks look like today, but I think what translates from having a background in design and architecture is, you know, we're not in the, the practice of actually building the buildings, we're in the practice of, in a way, selling and 
getting people bought in on a vision of a building. And it happens across a number of different media, right? It's mm. representation, it's drawings, it's imagery, it's, you know, videos, it's, you know, a story, a narrative that you create. And so for me, I think it's that aspect of sort of operating across all these different um, channels and media to help land an idea with a given audience. Mm. Do you think any of that's actually translatable to, I mean, a little bit of that sounds like what a marketing team would do, but I'm curious as to like within a traditional uh, architecture practice, but I'm curious as to like, you know, obviously there's a, you, you're part of a dedicated team that's helping sales to better educate customers and whatnot as to like what, what Airtable is and cross use case and whatnot. But, you know, what would be the kind of parallels for that within an art traditional architecture practice or is it out of reach? I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, and to be honest, I don't know if it's like a direct one-to-one -one translation and that, you know, enterprise SaaS is very different from like a paid services model. Um, but I think if you maybe separate the two, like the idea of just sales in the first place is very relevant and important for, for architecture firms. And I'm not going to pretend like I'm the expert in that domain, but just the recognition that, you know, projects aren't going to magically appear out of nowhere. And it is a numbers game to some degree, right? You have a pipe, you have potential leads that are coming in and they're going to convert at a certain rate, right? So being able to qualify and figure out, you know, where does it make sense for, you know, our BDR team, or even if it's like spanning marketing, where does it make sense for us to spend our time and going after these potential projects? And then how does that align with the capacity of the firm and, and the practice today? I think on the enablement side, um, yeah, absolutely. I think enablement is about, I know empowering is cheesy, but it's really about, you know, equipping people to do more and, and to do the types of things that they should be focused on doing rather than, you know, trying to make do with, you know, maybe everybody on the team is coming up against a common problem and, you know, having someone who is dedicated to identifying these sort of providing solutions that address the root cause um, and sort of seeing the gains of, of bringing everyone up together is, is something that I think would help all firms. I know a lot of that was like maybe fluff talk and words, but maybe we can get into the details a little later on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think it might be helpful to for those that might not um, have seen what Airtable actually looks like. So now we're talking a little uh, abstract of it. Maybe you can kind of walk us through a quick little demo to see what we're talking about. Yeah, sure. Let me just share my screen, and while I'm doing that, I guess. I'll start with a couple of um, just notes before diving in. Like this is definitely framed as like a high level diagram rather than like a full on rendering. But my hope is just to help illustrate how Airtable could be helpful for anyone who's here and, and running their own firm. Um, and then also I'll do my best to contextualize any Airtable specific terms, but George, maybe you can help jump in if you have any questions from your end. I know you're familiar with Airtable, but if there's anything that you think would benefit from double clicking into. Yeah, sure. Um, but cool, let's start here because I'm gonna be walking through a snapshot of my own experience, you know, working on an ff &E package and specifically, you know, I was tasked with finding like viable upholstery options for the soft seating in the lounge breakout spaces. So, um, you know, this is literally what I was doing for like a good two weeks of, of that project. But, you know, I knew that, you know, for upholstery, you know, we were looking for blue options that had to be below $35 per yard. It had to be at least 100K double rubs among a number of different options. But, you know, I would go in, click in, look at the information, you know, let's see. I don't know, this isn't particularly exciting, but it might be helpful to have a solid color. And then what I wish I could have done then um, is, you know, easily clip this information and send it to somewhere like an Airtable base. So for instance, I'm coming up into 
our Web Clipper app, which can also live in the extension. And you can see that it's pulling the product name, the URL. I could add the swatch and then also maybe like the in situ shot. And then I could fill out as much or as little information as I want. But for me, I just want to make sure that I'm covering my bases of like it's under $35 per yard and that it hits at least 100k double rubs and it looks like it's 300 so we're in a good place. And so if I add this record, um, you know, I could keep going and adding more but I could see where that lives in a base and an air table that's short for a database and really it's a collection of all the things you might need to see for a particular project or initiative. So you could see that same information here in what we call an expanded record. And all of that information lives in this card-like view. Um, but you can see that if I pop out of here, that same information is, let me just pop into this other view, that information lives here as this record or this row. And so the way that I like to think about um, a record is it's almost like this horizontal packet of information about this one thing. And so you could see here that for this particular option that we found, you know, we're tracking not only the manufacturer, and let me just fill that in, we're tracking the color, materials, price, number of rubs, etc. And this is a really great baseline. But you could imagine that over the course of a project, you're going to have more information that you need to track over time and layer on. And so that's something that's really powerful about Airtable because you can come in and customize and add additional fields or information that you want to track. And so one example that I could think of is, you know, each item that you see here in terms of, you know, Collier or Arcade, they almost need to go through a mini approval process um, in that, let me just make this a drop down or a pick list, in that you almost need to move them through the stages of like, you know, is this even in play in the first place? So, you know, does it hit the criteria that we're looking for? And if so, then like, does it get internal um, approval? You know, like does a project manager or a design principal need to sort of vet like, yes, like we're on board with this. And then finally, does the client approve? And then hopefully you have, you know, something selection, like something selected. And like, that's like the first choice that's probably going to be too expensive. So like you need like all these backups and then you're probably going to have a ton that is rejected at the end of the day. And so let's say just like the status of these options. And so, you know, while it's really important to have this repository of all of the options that you're looking at, you need to be able to also go through this process of making sure that you're moving this part of the project forward. And this is just like one small tiny part of a nested, you know, you can imagine a project is composed of a ton of decisions like these that all need to be tracked in some consistent and structured way. So for instance, like I mean, I'm just going to pretend like these are all in play and maybe these are like sort of waiting for someone to look at them and like we know that some are rejected off the bat. So this is great because then we can start to see, you know, if I'm in the mindset of like, you know, I'm not about like just researching, I want to start to like help move this project forward, I can go in and start to see, you know, at a high level view, just like how many are actually still in play, you know, these are maybe like our top contenders and like we know that these are out of the running, right? And one of the really powerful things about Airtable is that you have all of this information and then you're able to visualize it in a number of different ways. And so that's why you see, that's what you see in this bottom left corner are what we call views. And you have five different types of views that are available to, to create these lenses, if you will. So what we're looking at right now is a grid view. There's also a form view that allows you to collect information, ingest it, and 
put it into this um, table in a structured way. A calendar view gallery, which is sort of what I think of as like a Pinterest like view. And then what I'm going to go to is a Kanban view. And this is sort of like um, if you're familiar with Trello, this might resonate um, or a pipeline. <laughs> It'll also resonate, but it allows you to see all of your information in these stacks from left to right. And so you can see that right now they're stacked in terms of that status. And for me, what I really like about this, it's like at a high, at a quick glance, I could see visually like oh, you know, these are the things that we're sending to the principals to, to see if, you know, these work. Um, and these are all the ones that we've already rejected. And so, for instance, if you see something that jumps out, like, oh, actually, like, we're looking at blues and greens, and this obviously doesn't fit, I'm going to say rejected. And you'll see that that update that I just made here, if I go back to that original grid view, that status also updates here. And you could also see that in sort of that revision status um, to the right. And so this is just one way of illustrating that all of the information that's contained, um, sorry, going back, um, all of the different ways that you have to visualize this information, it's powered by that same core set of information. So, you know, everyone could be in this one place working at the same time, but they're able to look at just the cut of information exactly how they want to see it. So, you know, yeah. for instance, if someone's just like exploratory and looking, they can create a gallery view, or maybe this is already set up. And again, you can then see as much information as you want about a given product or as little information as you want. Um, I'm really anal about cropping and fitting. I think this works. Okay, cool. Um, and so this is, you know, I could kind of go on and on. Um, I'm going to show one more thing before I like hop over to um, one of my favorite parts about Airtable. It really blew my mind when I discovered it. But um, before then, um, let me just hop over to this view, which is filtered for this particular project, right? And so you can think of this as almost like a workbench for whoever's working on this project, which is Table Air School. So I'm saying, this is my project. Um, this is all good, but George say that you're also working on a similar project that is also institutional and actually a lot of these products are really great options for you as well. So rather than you sort of like being in, off in your own sheet or wherever, um, you're able to come here see like actually this makes a lot of sense. I can leverage a lot of the work that you've already done and then I'm just going to go in create my own view. It's I think it was apps academy was the project that you're working on. Um, I'm actually going to, you know, maybe you think that all of these are still really great options. So I'm going to tag in my project as well. Um, I want to see these too. Cool. And then you can filter it to just your project, right? And again, like we're still working off of the same set of information, but then you can go in and maybe like you just have a completely different process. And actually, you want to say, um, this is like George's research. <laughs> and these are all of your thoughts about, you know, what um, might work for, for your project. Um, I'm blazing through. So the last thing I want to show is one of my favorite apps. And um, apps are, you can almost think of these as like power ups, or they're mini apps that you know, live on top of all of the information in your base. And you can see here that this is the Web Clipper app that I showed earlier, which shows like these are all the fields that I'm able to clip from any site that I go to, and it sends it directly to the space. Um, but what I'm going to do is install an app called Page Designer, which I think of as an intelligent InDesign, especially when you're trying to generate like really quick cut sheets or um, even iterating through different options for different parts of the project. So you can see that you can select the format, but automatically you see that you're able to just drag and drop and compose a layout that is powered and that you know pulls the information from the table that we were just in. So you know that's a product name, that's like the image. And then you know again you can start to pull in, well maybe not materials because that wasn't filled out. 
but that price, um, let's see, abrasion is really important. You could start to do a lot better job than this, um, but you see that it dynamically updates as you flip through. And so I have one, I think, already set up here. Um, and so it's pretty simple, but you could see, actually, are you guys still able to see I hit present mode? Yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah, no, we could see it, yeah. Cool, That's great. So you can pull this up during a meeting, um, click into it. If you wanted to double click, you can click out into the website itself. Um, if you needed to you know, print this as a PDF, you could do that here. Um, and then you could also, share this information um, as a view share link. And so if someone for some reason wanted like an up-to-date view of all of the things that are still in play or just like an overview of all the options, like this will always be as up-to-date as the base itself. Um, and you could embed this even into an internal like wiki if that would be helpful for some reason. But um, this was a really quick whirlwind just great. Um, through a bunch of things, but I'm hoping that it's just helpful for whoever's on this call to just get some ideas going. Yeah, this is this is such a powerful uh, tool to be able to have this, you know, this kind of visual database to be um, that's leverageable in so many different types of use cases. Um, you know, I could see it where you could even take like the data that's exported from like as a, as a use case, right? You can export data from monograph mm -hmm. of an archive project or previous projects that you've been working on, put them in here and almost create like your own one page sheets, right? Using project images. Absolutely. To be able to just have that on hand, right? And you can embed them or share them on their own. And I think that's, that's a really, um, uh, call it a re really powerful uh, kind of tool. We also have some, uh, there may be some, there's actually a question here that might be good to just address now since you're on the topic. Um, Lindsay asks, um, hi Jackie, what do you think are the top three process and workflow shortcomings that small ARC firms face? And are there tools or ways to address them within Airtable? Um, that's an interesting one. I think definitely like the one you just addressed, right? FFNE is a pretty big challenge uh, for, for a lot of folks and, and the ability to kind of own that information over time and do it with with, uh, with it what they want is a really interesting one. Any other ones come come to mind? We can probably. Yeah, I'm curious to hear your top three and <laughs> I, I mean, can come up with my top three. Um, I'm just kidding. No, no. I, I think. Go ahead. Um, obviously, this one, I think I think one is one that I mentioned before is is managing almost as like a hybrid of two separate workflows that can live in one. but a way of managing what um, potential projects are sort of in your pipeline or just like what are like what are those potential projects and how are you tracking them and how are you making sure that you're on top of them? I think that's something that Airtable could help with. Apologies, George, if this is something that Monograph already has. No, no, we actually, we, we don't have a CRM functionality within Monograph. Yeah, but uh, I think at the it's moment, that But I think the pairing course. of it, yeah. And I'm actually really excited about um, the potential future of, of Airtable and Monograph working together, um, uh, whether through like third-party integrations and whatnot. But Same. yeah, this this idea of you know data in general should be able to move from one platform to another, you know, relatively easily. And like if if it's a you know whether you know short term, let's say from a from Monograph perspective, right? It's just like being able to. Uh, share that link of that FFNE page for that specific project within our notes in, in a monograph as like a first sort of first version of that workflow. That could yeah. be one. Uh, but yeah, I think like this idea of a CRM within Airtable is really, really powerful. Um, yeah. And I think to your point, it's really like, it's really about, it comes down to like, what is your practice and service of? And, you know, for architects, it, it really is about projects, about about buildings, right? And so whatever would be most helpful um, in helping like Lindsay, you manage your business, like from the beginning of like the inception of like a potential project all the way to like after a project is completed, right? And so, you know, how are you managing that part of the process when, you know, you're tracking down these leads and you're staying on top of, 
you know, these potential opportunities, making sure that, you know, you're following up. And then, you know, once those opportunities actually become real projects, I think that's where something like monograph is so critical because that is a beast in and of itself. Yeah. Um, there's so much nuance and like things to unpack and like actually managing and delivering on an architecture project that deserves like a purpose built solution for architects. And then like once a project is done, like how are you managing like the marketing aspect of how you're leveraging like the assets from completed projects? How are you managing the press? And it's sort of like this virtual cycle of then how does that lead to new potential projects? And then there's just like the baseline level of operations of, you know, operating your business, you know, like yeah. I can go on, but you know, like when people are applying to, to, to work with you, you know, that that's an application tracking, like an applicant tracking system that you could build in Airtable. So, right. Recruitment's another great use case, right? Yeah. Being able to keep tabs on people that have applied, even the form is actually pretty powerful. I'll, you know, I'll describe one use case in which, um, I've seen it used in due diligence, primarily more on the real estate side where you're trying to um, understand what are the parameters of a specific building. And so you have a, a series of questions that you can answer through here and it's your own database that stores that, that, that kind of information. And you can use that to trigger then um, different approvals or what, no, uh, you know, uh, green light, red light, you know, kind of operations or, mm -hmm. or whatnot. But uh, even for clients, right, you can send them a link to um, whether it's the Airtable uh, form or another uh, product like Typeform, which has a really nice kind of yeah. UI for, for yeah. forms and have that integrate with something like Airtable. Yeah. Right? And like the, the whole point here is that the future is really, whether it's like, um, you know, uh, very use case specific tools like Monograph, which are really purpose built for, you know, very like, like project management within architecture. Um, to other workflows that are that can be built out using Airtable or using these other tools that all speak to each other. Yeah. Um, and so the, the future is ultimately, you should be able to build out operations for yourself through these, th th through these tools that all end up talking to each other in some way. Um, but yeah, I think, I think uh, the due diligence side is really important because being able to have a client pre-screen in a way, right? They, they fill out a form, you can then even, I think, have some metrics, right? You can even build like yeah. little equations there to tell you, hey, is this, is this client like a score of 90? That's great. Are they a score of 10? Not so good. We shouldn't probably proceed with them. Yeah. Actually, can I share one more thing in Airtable for two minutes to follow up on that? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, because it's actually uh, something that's like very near and dear to my heart is that use case of um, managing applications. And so maybe for instance, say this is like all the list of where you're tracking people who have applied to your, like for internships, right? And so you can create a form and have people fill this out, right? And say, this is my name, like this is my like portfolio, this is a link to my website, et cetera. Have it come back in here once it's submitted. And this is also something that recently shipped back in September as part of our larger platform launch is that sort of logic that you described, George, of being able to say, you know, for instance, when, you know, someone submits their application, you know, in that contact table, you know, then send an email, right, to somebody. And I see this going both ways. It could send an email automatically to the person that applied to say like, thank you for applying, <laughs> acknowledging that it's been received, letting them know that like somebody will follow up if they are a fit, right? And then on the flip, it could send an email to whoever is in charge of this internally or it can send a Slack message. So this is like one example of like, you know, I just remember how much it meant to me when I would like apply for internships and actually heard back. I think it's like such a low lift thing to do that really um, shows respect for, for the time that people are taking. Yeah, that's great. That's a great use case. Um, we do have some additional questions, but before we get there, maybe we just want to spend a little bit more time about, um, you know, thinking, because we wanted to talk, talk a little bit about operations and unpack that a little bit further. Um, you know, I, I think we're of the opinion, or at least for like myself and some other folks in, outside of also Monograph as well, but uh, of the opinion that there should be, um, you know, 
operations is such a critical component to running a practice that as a, as a company starts to scale, being able to either distribute some of that operational thinking to your team members or having a dedicated position within the firm that's not just about the operations of, let's say, like, um, you know, HR practices and whatnot, but more in the, in the way that there's this kind of evolution of design operations where it's a team specifically dedicated to understanding the workflows and processes of a, of, of a design org and then building out the kind of long-term optimizations that make that team run more efficiently. But take, take, take that design ops role and like spread it around, like either centralize it where it's like one team actively thinking about the entire equation of a firm, like everything from the marketing all the way through delivery. Um, I'm curious how, how things like Airtable have unpacked that idea of ownership and operations for, for you know, its customers and, and especially anyone that you, you can think of from architecture. Yeah, that is, that's a great and loaded question. Um, you know, it, it, it makes me think of, I actually looked at the, the 2020 AAA firm report um, and I saw, and I think I just wanted to check if like the stat was still true and it, and it roughly was, but I think it said that 75% um, of architecture firms in the US today are one to 10 employees, right? Yeah. And that is nuts because not only do you have to be like a really talented designer if you're like running these firms, but everyone has to wear so many hats, right? And it's so, I mean, I think it's also like a blessing and a curse. And I think a lot of architects thrive on being these really strong generalists, but it's also a ton of context switching, right? Um, and operations is a type of thing at that scale where it's almost like death by a thousand paper cuts. Like mm. you don't really experience it maybe like full on until you sort of zoom out and see like, whoa, we spent like 20 hours doing X thing. And I think, you know, having a single person, like, you know, a full person dedicated to operations when you're at that scale, it's often like a luxury that I think most um, practices don't have though you know maybe starting to think about it through that lens of maybe zooming out maybe finding ways to incentivize you know how can we work better as a team um, to find those opportunities to, to maybe improve our processes and I don't really have like clear answers on that end but I think there has to be sort of that awareness in the first place and some incentive for people to do that, right? Because yeah. literally time is money. And at the end of the day, you need to sort of account for your time and, it, you know, billable hours is still a thing. And, you know, I knew when I wanted to explore maybe these types of things in the context of the firms that I worked at, it, it sort of had to be on my own time, right? Like I was interested in it. I thought it could really help. Um, but maybe at a base level, just like, recognizing it and sort of all being in it together um, as a team would be a good place to start. Yeah. You know, or even, even maybe flipping a little bit where it's, it's like, it's not so much that you should just be given necessarily the time. Like, it, it's not so much like, you know, at Google, they had the whole thing about like, what is it like 20% time? Yeah. I one day out of the to week. go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, one day out of the week, you get to kind of think about like, you know, far flung ideas. Um, and, you know, with a with with a with the propensity to like actually build it, right? I mean, it's not just like uh, pie in the sky stuff. But maybe there's a way in which what can be done as a firm owner is to instill this idea of like, or, or instill a practice of building business cases. So it's like, you know, everyone's welcome with their ideas. Um, you know, if a, if you can allocate time for people that have this, just in like a one paragraph pitch, like, hey, I think. I think if, you know, I'm sure every firm owner would feel delighted. I'm sure maybe we'll get some comments as to the contrary, but, uh, you know, as a firm owner to, to feel like your team is actually invested and involved in the success of the firm is a powerful point to get to where you feel like everybody, there's something about the culture now that's shifted and everyone feels like they're, they're also an owner. Um, and that, that kind of culture doesn't just emerge out of nowhere. That actually is something that firm owners have to 
right. continuously, uh, you know, address and promote. Yeah, I think to push that point even further, that that then has to sort of be backed up with with tangibles in some way, right? Is it equity? Is it sort of like, um, I don't know, like some bonus in some way? Because I think that ownership, it has to be like, it'd be great if it was really out of the goodness of everyone's heart, but like the incentives have to be aligned for that to work. Yeah. And I think that's what makes, I don't know, I think what you're, you're touching on is really just rethinking, you know, is there a way to practice architecture without being professional services? And I think that's why monograph has always resonated with me because it's this idea that you could you know, you don't have to just pick like one of the three things, right? Like a culture that's like great, like really great work. And like, um, I'm forgetting like the last thing, but you know, like it, it's like the thoughtfulness that yeah. with which you guys have approached designing like a viable business through creating your own products, through creating like revenue that's recurring that like creates, I'm just like projecting this, but you know, like, more of the cushion that allows you to have some flexibility and like the types of projects that you want to work on. I think if I were to, you know, go back into practice and I realize like running a practice is so hard and I have so much respect for the people that do it. Um, but I think I would find a way to, to create a source of recurring revenue to take the heat off of trying to um, make money slowly through selling time because there isn't sort of an exponential factor or multiple yeah. on that. Yeah. No, and there certainly are certain there certainly are ways today um, where one could utilize the resources of their own firm, right? If if you're a 10 person office, you have so much creative potential within your office to be able to generate other ideas that can that can you know sustain the business through thick and thin, uh, or at least maybe more so. Um, like even just thinking about like, you know, what would it mean for firms to become brands that people actually resonate with, right? Be, beyond like, you know, people might, you know, within the culture of, you know, coming from architecture, right? And like, there's sometimes there's this uh, uh, sense like HGTV, like, oh, they set up such miss, you know, they set up expectations that are completely unrealistic. But at the same time, you know, the people that are being impacted by those, those product, like the, the actual design process at the end of the day, they feel emotionally impacted. And that resonates with the brand, like, you know, like uh, Joanna and Chip Gaines, right? Or Joanna Gaines. Oh my God, I was just thinking. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like where, where you can then build a brand that then people want to, it's, it's like, it's not buying the product is sort of buying access to that person, right? They're just buying that, the same uh, lifestyle that that person is communicating. So I definitely agree on that front. I mean, I think for us, you know, ultimately, we just are very, very interested to understand how can firms, you know, recognize that there are all these other tools, that there's these tools available today that can empower an entire company to innovate and to like, also ultimately like more billable hours, right? We want to be able to give people time back. So for monograph side, it's like, how can we streamline certain things so that um, you know, there's more time for billable tool or, or like our new resource tool, which is allowing people to project the week real time with their budget, right? So they can see what, how their decisions are impacting the future of the project financially. And it's little things like that, that we think can empower architects ultimately over time to maybe allocate some additional, you know, whatever other time they have to thinking through, um, you know, Innovating on the business, and that's something we want to advocate for, and we want we want to continuously be promoting. That's why, like, even having you and Air talk about Airtable for us is really interesting because we see it as part of an ecosystem of just new, yeah. a new way of thinking about how to run run a, a practice using tools. And there's one one last point. It's like one thing that sort of grinds my gears ultimately is like there's so many cool tools for designers, but for the non designers on your team there's not many cool tools available. There's not many like, new ways of thinking about it. And so how can we help contribute to that culture of rethinking and um, you know, the, the same kind of innovation that's happening in design, let's bring it to the actual business of design. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think you like, you made this point um, really well just now, you know, like 
I hope he's using a tool for, you know, a tool's sake, right? Uh, or maybe, you know, if you really love Airtable or Monograph, that's a separate story. But, you know, it, it's really about what it unlocks for you. And I think for me, the the potential that I saw with, with Airtable specifically was, you know, one, like architects aren't afraid to just roll up their sleeves and like configure something, right? Like, I think at least from my, my experience, like we, like I was never given sort of training on all of the different tools we used. And you literally just have to like click around and figure it out and like you get what you need to get done. So I think for Airtable, I see that in the same way and that, you know, you're able to use this toolkit to hopefully design the things that would help give you back your time, you know, whether it's like that one hour a week that you use to review applications and sort of like manually copy and paste all of the portfolio PDFs into like wherever you're tracking them and automate some of that. And I think the ultimate goal is like, you know, like once you have that time back, like then you can sort of think beyond and, and sort of focus on like what you want to do, which is design, which is, you know, focusing on mm -hmm not not data entry and copying and pasting stuff so i think for me yeah. that's really where i saw like your table coming in yeah um we got a great question here uh christopher rose i've used filemaker in the past and it seems Airtable is very similar but more powerful the thing i enjoyed about filemaker is you can basically do custom programming can yeah. Airtable do that a hundred percent we didn't we didn't touch um on sort of custom apps and scripting in Airtable, but those are definitely options. If you're comfortable with doing that in FileMaker Pro, you'll be able to do that in Airtable as well. Very, very cool. Um, this one's a more a more uh, specific question by Paola about project teams and being able to edit. The short answer is yes. There's like a longer answer that correlates to the different levels of permission a person has, but I'm happy to take that offline and we could connect and you can answer that more in depth. Yeah, permissions is such an interesting topic within within architecture. Um, we like in a monograph, we have permissioning as well. Um, it's obviously one of the most I, I, the my own internal joke is that like most businesses really just rely on permission. Like you could build a product about just permissions and it would be huge just because it's such a necessary uh, uh, type of features uh, feature set. But I'm also curious. I'm also, and I'm looking to invite as a guest uh, in the future, a firm that, that uses Monograph where everyone has uh, full access mm -hmm. to, um, to, to Monograph. Uh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, they, have, they all have admin access, I believe. And obviously, you know, these kind of processes make a lot of sense, probably when you're a smaller firm, as you get larger, it's just, you need more nuanced level of control because you know, you just potentially don't have the same culture, the same, a lot of different things. It makes total sense, right? Is from a business perspective. Um, but I am gonna try to try to bring this person on so that we can talk a little bit about this. So what, what is it? And, and from their take, how has that helped that business in some way? How does that empower them, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about this whole thing of, um, uh, you know, coming up with new ideas with Airtable, if everybody has access to all that data, then ultimately, they can come up with use cases as to like, oh, maybe I can connect this and this. And, you know, what initially took me three hours to do manually, I just wired it up. And like that kind of thinking within your firm, yeah. where employees can think that way of like process space is, is un unlocks huge leverage. Yeah. Um, we have a question here. Our studio has spent an embarrassing amount of time evaluating various <laughs> platforms, including Monogram, but not yet Airtable, for operations, time tracking, project management, and, con and continually have struggled to find the best perfect fit. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. I hope we should definitely, <laughs> we should definitely talk, Peter. But uh, what advice do you have for us in the trenches trying to evaluate all these platforms that can be moving targets in terms of functionality when we prefer to, to be doing actual architecture? That's a great uh that last part of it, I think, really contextualizes the question in a way that's that I have to kind of think about. Um, you know, I think, I, I mean, I at least can speak to to my own experiences too. Ultimately, a lot of times, and I think this is true of the industry in general, right? It's actually a very small industry when you think about it. Like everybody knows each other. Uh, for context, even before this call with Jackie, we have three or four mutual friends that we just kind of all 
uh, know, know, know each other through. So it's a, it's a pretty small community. Um, and so word of mouth ends up being a really big factor in how to help people evaluate decisions. You know, obviously it, it, I think it, it comes through like webinars like these where we try to bring other, other companies and other people that are doing interesting things to help kind of expand. But obviously right when you're talking about evaluating them for the needs of your business, I think that's, I, I don't know of any kind of really top of my mind solution that could just streamline that for someone because ultimately tools are a reflection of the culture of a firm. And so if, if you are trying to, like you need to invest time in that, pra- in that process a bit, um, we try to simplify things as much as possible to try to get you to something successful. Um, you know, we, we've done things like migrate people's data. We to just get them to see what it's going to look like. And we, we offer that, you know, as, um, as a company. Um, but yeah, I wonder, I mean, for, for you, Jackie, have you experienced any of this where it's like the time it takes for people to really understand and evaluate and compare tools like your table? Yeah, no, this is a great question. And I feel like there have like two, um, parts to, to what I think would be helpful. Uh, you know, obviously there's, there's like the very structured approach where like you obviously are going to have a list of requirements, I think from the perspective of user stories, right? So for instance, like as um, a project manager, I need to do X, Y, Z um, in order to do Y, right? Or as a marketing person at the firm, I need, you know, and I think it's sort of getting on the same page identifying like what's a need to have versus a nice to have, and then just making sure that whatever you're looking at can meet those like need to haves. Um, I think at the other end of the spectrum, like nothing can be a referral, like a different versions of like referrals or like stories from other people who have used the product that are similar to you in terms of your role, in terms of like the type of firm profile. And so, you know, this is something that I could help with, at least in terms of Airtable, in terms of seeing if I could connect you to other um, users of Airtable for something similar to, to how your firm is using it. But I think that's also just a great way to ask the questions that you might not think to ask, like, what can it do this? Can it do that? I think one of the few, like, tools that I've actually heard, like, architects rave about that I can recently think of is... is um, yeah, is it Bluebeam? Like Bluebeam? Yeah, yeah, Bluebeam. Yeah. And it's yeah. just, it, it's so, um, it's like the one thing that I'll actually hear architects like rave about and like recommend to others. And so I think if you're able to find someone who has like somewhat of a similar profile with what you're looking for and has like tested out some of these, I think that would also be a great way to augment sort of like that more like tops down, like requirements list approach. Yeah, yeah. I hope that helps. Yeah, I think I think so. I think that that, that was really nice uh, way to talk about that. Um, we have another questions uh, here in the chat, um, which I think are more pertinent to to um, Airtable, uh, specifically AAC industry. Uh, do you have thoughts about bring, bringing three D integration to Airtable and connecting database spreadsheet information to building models? That's a really great question. I think when Airtable first at launched apps, which were called blocks at the time, there was like a 3D modeling or like visualization block. Was, but I think yeah. it was more so like, hey, this is like a really cool example of a use case than actual, um, actually functionally being used. Um, I think so. I think it's a question of um, maybe who sort of pushes this forward. And I could see how it would likely be pushed be pushed forward by someone in the Airtable community who's leveraging the API, who's leveraging the ability to build custom apps on top of an Airtable. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that, that's really exciting. That actually makes me think that, uh, thanks Claire for that question. It makes me think that I'm going, oh, hi, Claire. To, uh, going to invite uh, um, someone from another former WeWorker that was actually more direct in using um, using Airtable specifically for this context where they have bought building mod BIM data hosted within Airtable, um, which is uh, pretty wild. Um, there, oh, someone commented on your uh, Bluebeam. Alvaro commented on the Bluebeam plug. Uh, general GC is apparently taking the lead on this and uh, offering better collaboration between the architects and the GCs. 
And this is actually kind of an interesting, interesting yeah. uh, topic where, you know, where's innovation coming from within the industry ultimately? Uh, I would argue from our vantage point, we just see so much more. And obviously the economics of the industry is a meta narrative to the whole thing. Yep. But GCs taking the lead on pushing forward new ways of working together, and especially the larger GCs that, that are incentivized from everything from like recruitment. So they like, they show up to like a job, job, uh, well, when people showed up in person, but, you know, uh, job fairs with like drones to kind of show like how, how cool working at a, a large uh, GC company might be. So, yeah, I think um, there, there is something there about where is innovation coming from. And we hope that, you know, the whole point of us is ultimately to try to spear, spearhead some of that within, within the architecture side. Um, there's a... Uh, Oh, uh, more more tactical. Is there a way to customize the formatting of the PDF page in Airtable? Yes, as as much as you you want to customize the page designer layout. Yeah, I yes. think that's what. I, <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's the answer. Um, okay. Well, I I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining us on today's um, conversation with Jackie. It was really awesome to kind of talk about these different topics with you. And also for you to kind of take the time to show us uh, a use case, a really appropriate use case for, for Airtable. Um, yeah, same. Thank you so much for having me. This was yeah. a lot of fun. And so for also, those that, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't know if I got, like we were able to get to everyone's questions, at least about the Airtable specific stuff. So if anyone wants to reach out to me directly, um, my email is just jackie at airtable.com. Awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, for everyone that's left, uh, that's still that's still with us, uh, if you want to have real-time visibility into your firms in terms of real-time budgets and a lot of the topics we talked about today, you know, feel free to try us out at monograph.io uh, and, and uh, poke around. Um, thank you so much, Jackie, for, for joining me. It was great. Yeah, really thank you, George. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Bye.